Shalom and welcome. Thank you for joining me on this unique study into the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, as an introduction to myself, my name is Jude Sanchez, and I'm currently 19 years old, about to become a sophomore, and I've been blessed to be part of an amazing campus ministry here in San Antonio, Texas. So shout out to you guys. But uh, nonetheless, I've been studying Hebrew a little bit over a year now, and uh, I mention this because I believe I've found some or at least come across some very interesting perspectives that have changed my spirituality and have changed my outlook on this unique book. Um, and I'd like to share some of these things, right? Uh, and I'd like to help fuel that drive, but uh, I've also created this book because I do believe that as time passes on, you know, scholars and people who are within the academic field will also pass on. So there is going to be a need of um, younger scholars and younger disciples who are willing to take the initiative and step up into the field of academics. So this video is uh, created for that purpose. It's created to help fuel that drive and, and uh, keep the fire lit and keep the torch going. I've also created this video to um, help address some of the common questions that arise from our interpretation of Ecclesiastes as modern Christians. Uh, I do believe that very easily um, we can interpret, you know, this book as being, you know, pessimistic, maybe even depressing, uh, and even contradictory to some of the scriptures that we're already familiar with. So I wanted to say that I'm not here to give, you know, definitive truth or cast, you know, absolute, um, you know, uh, perspectives that scholars, you know, completely agree with. But I do want to say that um, I am a disciple who's very passionate in exploring uh, alternative uh, hermeneutical lenses that, you know, can possibly benefit our interpretation and possibly benefit our spirituality, right? So nonetheless, thank you for joining me and Shalom. Now, the purpose of this study is not so much to focus on the interpretation of Ecclesiastes uh, in scripture or answer the apparent reality of the retributive paradox. So, for example, why God allows sin to exist on the earth, but justice uh, appears not to be distributed equally or fairly, right? Uh, rather, we can expect to see here the historical exegesis or interpretation on Ecclesiastes through time uh, in both rabbinic and Christian circles. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the cultural and socio-political context that may have shaped its literary nature, right? We'll be looking at the etymology, philology, and meaning of uh, critical words that occur in Ecclesiastes throughout the book, uh, early pieces of literature that serve as valid witnesses to the original Hebrew scriptures, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Talmud or the Mishnah, and finally, arguments drawn from the voices of narration. So at this point, I've kind of laid the foundation for what we can expect about this study, but more specifically, I just want to look at really why I've actually made this study for you. Um, I believe that if we change our common hermeneutical lens on how we look at and perceive uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, we can really draw out some beautiful key messages. Uh, so what are I actually, what do I mean by this? Uh, well, I want to observe Ecclesiastes uh, from a non-Solomonic perspective. Uh, so this just means looking at the book as having not been written by the hand of Solomon. Uh, and this does not mean that it's non-canonical or that it's uninspired, but just simply changing uh, our her, our uh, common hermeneutical lens, right? Uh, but why? Why exactly would we do this? Well, uh, if we look at the cultural and socio-political uh, environments that may have, have uh, inspired this text, uh, we may be able to identify how the spirit uh, used such normalities to challenge, stimulate, and uh, warn its original Hebrew and Israelite audience, right? So I believe Ecclesiastes is not a remnant of a dying man's autobiography. Uh, this is so much more greater. This is uh, one of possibly the greatest Jewish thought experiments to have ever been written. Uh, so kind of what do I mean by this? Well, if we look at a Kohelet, um, as, we will, as we will see later on, uh, we see that he's a personification of a Solomonic archetype, right? Uh, what I mean by this is that it's a literary design uh, used to kind of encapsulate the key uh, characteristics of Solomon, uh, as we've seen in First Kings, right? Uh, so as to demonstrate the thought, life, and uh, attitude of one who tests and explores all that the world has to offer without limitations, right? So again, this is a grand, this is to look, to look at Ecclesiastes as a grand thought experiment, 
uh, and an illustration and, and piece of art with uh, imagery and, uh, and poetic usage uh, rather than an autobiography, right? All right, all right. So having said these things, uh, we're now going to be looking at the main points that will make up this study. So as you can see here, I have a list of the, the chapters that we're going to be going through. And first up is the etymology to the title Ecclesiastes. So I'm sure you've wondered yourself, what does Ecclesiastes like mean? Like that word isn't even in, it's really not even an English word. Uh, so we're going to be looking at what the original authors were intending uh, to convey when they use the, the original Hebrew and Greek names, right? Second to that, we'll be looking at the canonical placement, where it's placed within the Bible, but more specifically, where it's placed within the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, okay? Uh, third to that, we'll be looking at Hebrew and Greek terminologies that are crucial, that are, I, I can't stress this enough, that are crucial towards interpreting uh, the, the message that um, Kohelet may have been trying to convey. Um, fourth to that, we'll be looking at the early rabbinic and Judaic interpretations uh, so what the early Jews were thinking and how they used the book of Ecclesiastes uh, to establish some of their logic and some of their arguments uh, very early on after the death of Christ. And then very similar to that, we'll be looking at the early Christian interpretations. So pretty much within Christian circles, how they were looking and perceiving the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, then following that, almost the same thing, the modern interpretation, but instead of uh, giving a very specific uh, interpretation will really just be giving, well, I'll be giving more of a generalized uh, understanding of how the book is perceived today, right? Uh, following that, the literary analysis. Now, this chapter is very, very important. We'll be looking at why modern uh, scholars debate that the book is actually non-Solomonic, right? Why it has not been written by the hand of Solomon. Uh, so that is a very important chapter. Uh, I can't, I can't stress that enough. And Following that, we'll be looking at the Egyptian, Sumerian, Akkadian, and Hellenistic literature. So I've mentioned these four different uh, sources of influence because as we explore and, and dive into those pieces of literature, they share very similar structures to the book of Ecclesiastes and how it's laid out, how it's presented, uh, and actually how it's narrated. So that's also a very uh, important and beautiful chapter. And then last of all, I'll be talking about uh, my pre-analytical message, which will kind of sum up the main points and takeaways uh, for what we've expected and seen in this study. Uh, and that will also be the bridge to my next lecture. All right, so let's begin. So as of this point, we have arrived at our first chapter, the etymology of title. So where does the name Ecclesiastes come from? In this chapter, we'll be looking at the Greek translation, and we're going, we're going to be going deeper into the Greek translation. And then we're going to be going into the original Hebrew translation and what the author was probably trying to convey as he was using that name. So as you can see in the top left corner here, you can see Ecclesiastes as it probably would have looked like as the early Christians were gazing over their Septuagint or their Greek Bibles. But the name is brought from late Latin. Ecclesiastes actually has its true roots through Greek etymology. It is defined as a participant in an assembly of citizens. It has been adopted by the Septuagint translators as a rendering for the Hebrew word Kohelet, named in the title verse for the author of the biblical book. Um, Ecclesiazen is the verb for holding or demonstrating a public assembly as is being an active member. The Ecclesia is the actual assembly of citizens and can be found in Strong's Concordance number 1577. The test at the end of the word signifies the agent suffix to describe the agent or rather possessor of the noun. So in this case, ecclesia is the noun. It is the assembly, the convocation. Ecclesiastes is one who um, guides the assembly or one who actually holds the assembly. So I kind of just want to say this up front. I'm not the best at Greek pronunciation. Um, if I get something wrong, just text me or email me. But ultimately, we're going to be looking at the ecclesia, the assembly or the convocation as a noun. It is, ecclesia is, ecclesias, ecclesian, is derived from ekaletos, which means called out or forth. This word in itself is derived from ekaleo, properly a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public, into some public place, an assembly so used. 
So an actual occurrence of this is in Acts 19.39, and this is in NIV, but if there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. And you can actually, if you look at this in the Greek Bible, you can see it in the bottom left corner there, highlighted in the yellow. But um, yeah, I just want to say I'm, I'm not, the, not the best at Greek uh, pronunciation. So bear with me. All right, cool. So at this point, we've already looked at the Greek terminology. Now we're going to be switching over to the Hebrew. So as you can see on the uh, top left corner here, you can see in the Aramaic squared script, the title Kohelet. Um, and according to Strong's Dictionary, Kohelet is defined as a collector of sentences, a preacher and her son of David. As a part of speech, it is a masculine noun. This word is taken from the feminine active singular participle kahal, uh, which I'll show you on the next slide. So I also wanted to point out that kahal is equivalent, or at least very much so, equivalent to the Greek ekklesia. Um, and it would be to assemble or gather for religious and or political reasons. Um, and it would be defined as to summon an assembly for war, judgment, or religious purposes. A primitive root to convoke, to assemble, an assembly, convocation, or congregation. So just as Ecclesiastes is the Hebrew rendition of the Greek ecclesia, so kahal is the Hebrew rendition of the Greek ecclesia. Canonical placement. So here I wanted to cover where can we find Ecclesiastes within the Bible, but more specifically, where can we find it within our Hebrew Bibles and why there? So I have with me uh, my, actually my Hebrew Bible, and as you can see, it says Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, and that just means the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. You can notice how in the top middle of this page, it says in the Aramaic square script, Ketuvim, and Ketuvim, because of the old men, means that it's a masculine noun, but within the Tanakh, Ecclesiastes is located within the Ketuvim known as the Writings in Hebrew, it's plural. Within the Ketuvim, Ecclesiastes is contained within a section titled Megilot, plural for Megillah meaning scroll. The early church called this section the Hagiographa, meaning holy or sacred writings. Hagio meaning holy and graph drawn or written. Now, as you, you can see in this picture, it begins with the Song of Songs and then Ruth and then Lamentation and then Ecclesiastes and then Esther. Now, in modern interpretation, notice how the Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes are not paired with the wisdom literature where Proverbs dwells. And this is just uh, one interesting to note. We, we won't get into the, the authorship yet. We'll be getting into that in a, in a later chapter. But yes, Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew Bible is contained within the Ketuvim, which just simply means writings. We are now covering our chapter on Hebrew and Greek terminology. And I want to say here that before we go in, that the English translation is obviously not poor, it is clearly good, and that we can learn many things from it. I want to say rather that here I want to stress the importance of Hebrew. Uh, I do believe that as we uh, consider the original words that the author used, that we can definitely change our perspective because uh, some of the words that are used to pivot the message uh, definitely change the course of what what is um, being intended to to be conveyed. So nonetheless, the English is, is clearly not bad. I, I don't believe that. But we ought to consider the Hebrew and the original word selections and definitions. So I would definitely say this is like my favorite word in all of Hebrew. But we're going to be looking at in the top left corner here in the Aramaic square script, the word, the noun, hevel. It occurs 73 times throughout the Old Testament and 38 times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. This word is often mistranslated as futile or vain. However, this word really connotates more of a substance than it tells an enigmatic, fleeting, or transient nature. And that is, in my opinion, transient, fleeting, or enigmatic. Although the best translation for this word is vapor and or mist, which is seen in this example in Proverbs. So, here in Proverbs uh, 21, 6, you can see the making of treasures by lying tongue is a vapor, is a hevel driven away of those seeking death. So hevel in some English Bibles is translated as futile or vain or meaningless, although in other contexts it's translated as vapor or mist. So it's kind of like when you walk out on a cold day, you take a breath in and you breathe out and that vapor that comes out, that's what the Hebrew author is trying to paint a picture of. He's trying to say, this is not something that is most likely vain. He's 
kind of trying to say this is something that is here, although this is something that is soon to dissipate. It is transient. It is fleeting. Um, and in some cases, it is enigmatic. To me, this is also a cool phrase. I kind of like to say it because it kind of just sounds funny on the tongue, but the phrase grasping of wind or vexation of spirit, uh, as is rendered in some translations, contextualizes or gives a better context to the definition of hevel as vapor or mist. And Strong's in Strong's Concordance 7469, Reut is a feminine noun defined as longing or striving and is a derivative of Strong's 7459 and is a masculine noun defined as purpose or aim. Now you can find this actually in Ecclesiastes 2.17 or 6.9, but I've actually pulled up a scripture here so we can see it, and this is 1.14, and I'm going to be reading in the Hebrew. Now it says, And I'm reading the, the end portion here in English, and it says, And be, behold, or indeed, the everything Havel is enigmatic, is, is transient, is fleeting. Ure utru ach, and a grasping of wind. So we can look at this phrase as the action that results in what is Havel. So it's like grasping oil uh, with the hands. It's very slippery. There's there's almost nothing there. Um, you can picture it as I, as I demonstrated before, as when you breathe out on a cold day, you're, you're kind of grasping those water molecules, uh, I'm sorry, water molecules, and they're not really there. It's, it's, it's just, it just, it's, um, it just dissipates very quickly. So the phrase here, um, as I see it, is one's intention where we go. It's the action that leads to heaven. Um, it's our longing, our striving, uh, our purpose, or our aim. So now we're going to be looking at the Greek phrase, which is a rendition of the Hebrew phrase, re'uturach, apoi pesis numatos. And it is defined as, I lead forth in the judicial sense. And I want to stress uh, judicial, into court. I precede, go before, I go too far. So in this sense, it is to be brought forth or to go, in the judicial sense. In this sense, a litigation, a cause and effect. Numatos, in this case, can still mean wind or spirit. In Greek, it's virtually the same, based on context. It's possible that the Greek is trying to say the embrace of transience, that is what is Hevel, due to natural law, retributively brings forth wind. So I think I kind of think of this as because of the law that God has embedded within the universe. When we pursue that law, specifically what is Hevel or transient, we ourselves bring forth wind or vexation or spirit, um, a vexation of spirit or a striving towards wind into our lives. Mata iltis is to me a very interesting word and I do believe I have some opinions about it which are not factually based but do change somewhat of the interpretation. But Mata iltis is the Septuagint word used in substitution for the Hebrew word Havel. Strong's 3153, Mata iotes enam is defined as aimlessness due to lacking purpose or any meaningful end nonsense because transitory and i do want to stress transitory i speculate that this noun may be etymology linked to meta as a possible cognate meta simply means beyond or after as in the study of metaphysics which in greek literally means that which is beyond physiki or nature in this sense that would give mata iotes the nature of fragility and transience rather than vanity so my opinion and this is not factually based but my opinion is that perhaps Meta is a cognate or at least shares somewhat of relationship with Mata Iotis. And Mata Iotis would then have the definition of something that is aimed towards being beyond. It is aimed towards something that is at least in the state of moving towards that which is beyond. So yes, this is my opinion, but it is not factually based. The word parties is actually not etymologically linked to Hebrew. It's actually from old Avestan Zoroastrian scriptures. And one thing that's really interesting is that it shares a relationship with early Jewish thought in the sense that it's connected with garden-like imagery. In the Zoroastrian scriptures, uh, paridesia were like wells. They were like things that men would create in order to align themselves with nature and ultimately take care of nature. And they were seen as things that 
um, produced life and um, created fertility for the earth. But I'm going to read this quote here. Um, and it says the word paradise, and I'm probably going to mispronounce all these words, but entered English from the French paradis, inherited from the Latin paradesus, from Greek paradesios, from old Iranian form, proto-Iranian, pravadiha, walled enclosure, whence old Persian paridida, or paridedam, avestin parideza. By the 6th, 5th century BC, the old Iranian word had been borrowed into Assyrian, pravadesu, domain. It subsequently came to indicate the expansive walled gardens of the first Persian Empire, and was subsequently borrowed into Greek as um, Paradesios, Park for Animals, in the Anabasis of the early 4th century BC. Athenian Xenophon Aramaic as Pardesa, Royal Park, and Hebrew as Pardis, Orchard, appearing in the Tanakh three times. Greek Paradesios was used to translate both Hebrew parties and the Hebrew word gan, which just means garden. It is from this usage that the use of paradise is used to refer to the Garden of Eden. The same usage also appears in Arabic in the Quran as firdos, from a vestic of old Persian origin. Compare vestic paradesa, enclosure, with which is compounded of pari around and deza, wall. The first element cognate with Greek peri around or about. The second element is cognate with Greek uh, tekos, wall, Greek paradesios, park the Garden of Eden paradise, whence the Latin paradesus is also of old Persian origin, Aramaic pardis, borrowed from Hebrew. And then you can look up this words in, in Strong's Concordance 6508, but yes, it does have a very, and I won't go into this extensively, but it does have a very interesting relationship with Zoroastrian literature, if you have to look that up, which I do suggest, but Pete's gum, like parties, is also not etymologically linked to Hebrew. It's Old Persian, and it's a masculine noun meaning command, word, or affair, and it just means to come to or to arrive. Patgam is cognate with the Greek pathegma, which means spoken word. It is found in the English word apothegm, from Greek, from Greek Apothegma, terse pointed sayings, so kind of like a harsh saying, um, like a command, um, but literally something clearly spoken. From apothengesthai, to speak one's opinion plainly, from apo meaning from, and fethengesthai, to utter. The phrase ba'aleo support is an interesting one. It could be translated as lords or masters of sayings or collections. But as I was researching this phrase, I came across certain group of people that argued that uh, this phrase points to a later date because of its usage within the Mishnah. So I actually looked into the Mishnah and typed in the phrase, and I wasn't able to find a repetitive usage outside of its uh, recalling of the actual scripture from Ecclesiastes. So in this sense, I didn't find the Mishnah to actually use the phrase on its own naturally, without actually recalling the scripture that contains the phrase from Ecclesiastes, if that makes sense. But uh, I'm going to read an actual quote from the Talmud, and it's in Aramaic, so I can't read that, but I'll read the English, and it says, Sanhedrin 12a7, and the offspring of Nashon sought to establish a pillar, but that Ed, uh, Edomite did not allow them to. Nevertheless, the members of the assembly gathered, and they established a pillar in the month in which Aaron the priest died. Tamut Bavli Seder Nazikin Tractate Sanhedrin 12a7. So, yes, I wasn't able to find all the research and resources, although I myself do not have all the resources to look for it. The word Yitron. Kohelet's repeated use of Yitron, benefit, surplus, or uh, profit, is found on an accounting document from the late 5th century BC, which means profit or net gain. So this brings up the idea of how can Solomon, who's living in the in 1000 BC, use words that are dated to the 5th century BC. Although there is extensive debate on this, I'm not going to be going into that, but we'll be going into that later. So for now, we're just going to look at the uh, left quote that I have here, and I'm not going to read all of it, I'm just kind of going to synthesize it, but 
Ultimately, there was a Jewish community that lived in Elephantine, or Elephantine, I'm not sure, uh, that left some Aramaic documents. And in these Aramaic documents, there are, at least to my knowledge, there is one word that is used that is used in Ecclesiastes that Solomon or Kohelet uses. Um, and then there are a few other words which I'm not sure are Aramaic. I believe they are. But uh, I looked in Strong's Concordance, they were explicitly identified as having an Aramaic etymology. But I do speculate that they are because of this quote. So I'm going to read it. The specific language of economic power in the Aramaic documents from Elephantine may furnish a context for some of Kohelet's vocabulary. The two sources share a cluster of terms including yitron, surplus, cheshron, deficit, and cheshbon, account. So yeah, those three, um, those three words that I just mentioned may be Aramaic. I'm not sure, but uh, I do believe they are important for dating the actual uh, book itself. At this point, I've already looked at Yitron, so we're not going to go into it extensively, but it is from Yatar, which means remain over from Aramaic, as you can see, late Hebrew, Aramaic, noun, rest, remainder. So in this sense, it's not a deficit, it's the surplus, it's the profit, it's the remainder from something. So as Solomon, or at least as Kohelet is speaking, the question that he often raises is, what is the profit of what man does under the sun? So in this sense, we are thinking about this word as what does man acquire? What is the summation of all of his works that he takes into the life that he will live after he dies? Or if he doesn't live at all after the next life, what is he taking? What is that purpose? What is his gain? Cheshron, possibly Aramaic. It does say late Hebrew. Uh, and it does say derivatives Aramaic, um, chasar, but it is a thing lacking, a deficiency. Cheshbon, like Cheshron, may also have an Aramaic etymology. As you can see here in the Brown Driver Briggs definition, it says think account, and it says late Hebrew, ID, Aramaic, um, chasaf. So, Yes, it may have an Aramaic etymology, but I'm not entirely sure. But at this point, we can just say a reckoning account, um, and it is a masculine noun. So now we have entered our fourth point into the early rabbinic and Judaic interpretation of Ecclesiastes. So here we're going to be looking at how relatively soon after the death of Christ, how Jews were perceiving, understanding, and interpreting the book of Ecclesiastes and how really late into the end of the millennia, how Jews were also understanding the book, how they perceived it to be scriptural or inspired or actually uncanonical in some debates within the Mishnah, but that we'll be getting into right now. The Mishnah. Misha's, Mishnah, also spelled Mishnah with an H, in Hebrew means repeated study because Shana or uh, Sheni, I'm sorry, just means two. So in this case, uh, repetition. Plural, Mishnayot is the oldest authoritative post-biblical collection and codification of Jewish oral laws, systematically compiled by numerous scholars called Tanayim over a period of about two centuries. The codification was given final form early in the third century AD by Yehuda Hanasi or Judah the Prince. The Mishnah supplements the written or scriptural laws found in the Pentateuch. It presents various interpretations of selective legal traditions that had been preserved orally since the time of Ezra, 450 BC. Why exactly am I going into the Mishnah? Well, glad you asked. Here, one of the earliest mentions of Ecclesiastes is contained, as well as a dispute of the Book of Ecclesiastes in a section titled Yadaim under the Seder or order of Tahorot or purities. And this earliest mention is within rabbinic circles, not Christian. However, it is very significant that the rabbis in this section come to a decision, since most debates in the Mishnah are intentionally unresolved. The debate within Yadayim is between two Pharisaic schools, which existed around AD 10. So in the Mishnah, uh, minority groups often give their opinions. So instead of the Mishnah having just one answer for one question, it contains multiple answers uh, for one question. The, and that is common. So in this case, what's interesting is that 
the, the dispute over Ecclesiastes is, uh, it does come to a, dis a decision which is very unique. The debate within Yadim is between two Pharisaic schools which existed around AD 10. Beth Shammai, or House of Shammai, maintained that Ecclesiastes does not make the hands unclean, a rabbinic way of arguing for uncanonical inspiration. So uh, the House of Shammai believed that the book of Ecclesiastes was uh, uninspired. On the contrary, Beth Hillel, or the House of Hillel, argued for the book's canonicity as possessing the divine power to make the hands unclean. So a rabbinic way of saying that Ecclesiastes was uh, unspiritual or uninspired is to say that it, that it makes your hands unclean. And this is kind of backwards to us, but in the rabbinic mind, uh, if, a, if it had the ability to make your hands unclean, then it had the spiritual or the divine or the God power, if you will, to, to condemn you. Mishnah, and this is in the Tosefta Berachot 2.22. I have here a quote actually from the Mishnah, and I can't read this because this is in uh, this is in Aramaic, I believe. But it says, "Hello, Hazakin says," and it just means "Hello, the elder says." Do not be afraid being naked. Do not be afraid being dressed. Do not be afraid while standing. Do not be afraid while sitting. Do not be afraid when laughing. Do not be afraid when crying. As it is said, there is a time to cry and a time to laugh. Ecclesiastes 3:4. So what's interesting about this is that the Mishnah is using Ecclesiastes to establish its logic. And one thing to note is that if the early rabbis were writing the Mishnah and they were using Ecclesiastes to uh, build upon their logic, then it would be contradictory that they would use Ecclesiastes uh, for something that they believe uh, is, in their minds, would be unauthoritative to create something in their own minds authoritative. I'm reading another quote from the Mishnah, and this is from Yadayim 3.5. And uh, what is in parentheses, that is what I've added, just to kind of give a little, little background to this quote. But nevertheless, all the holy scriptures defile the hands, that is, possess inspiration from the spirit to discern uncleanliness. The Song of Songs, in Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, defile the hands. Rabbi Yehuda says, the Song of Songs defiles the hands, but there is a dispute about Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Rabbi Yosef says, Kohelet does not defile the hands, but there is a dispute about the Song of Songs. Rabbi Shimeon says, the ruling about, Kohelet is one of the leniencies of Beit Shammai, House of Shammai, and one of the stringencies of Beit Halel. Rabbi Shimon ben Azai says, or said, I have received a tradition from the 72 elders on the day when they appointed Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah, head of the academy, that the Song of Songs and Kohelet defile the hands, that is, they are uh, inspired. Rabbi Akiva said, far be it, no man in Israel disputed that the Song of Songs sang that it does not defile the hands, for the whole world is not as worthy as the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all the writings are holy, but the Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. And this is a Hebrew way of, of uh, emphasizing the greatness of something. So in this case, Kodesh Kodeshim, it is the, the most holy as you can see in the tabernacle, but if they had a dispute, they had a dispute only about Kohelet. Rabbi Yochanan ben Yoshua, the son of the father-in-law of Rabbi Akiva, said, said in accordance with the words of Ben Azai, so they disputed and so they reached a decision. So nonetheless, the Mishnah uh, rarely makes a decision. And in this case, it does make a decision on Ecclesiastes, which does stress its, uh, its authority. Babylonian Talmud Sanhedrin 20b 17. Composed in Talmudic Babylon 450 through 550 CE, Sanhedrin, the Sinyad, belongs to the fourth order, or Seder, Nezekin, the order of damages, and discusses the rules of court proceedings in the Sanhedrin, the death penalty, and other criminal matters. It has 11 chapters. So I've included it just in case you'd like to check it out yourself, which is, which is really interesting. But nonetheless, you can see here in the Aramaic square script, uh, an actual quote from the Talmud in the Aramaic, and this is the translation. It says, Resh Lachish continues, and ultimately Solomon declined further still that he ruled only over Israel. As it is stated, I, Kohelet, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. Ecclesiastes 1-2. And ultimately, he ruled over only Jerusalem. As it is stated, the words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem.
Ecclesiastes 1.1. 1, 1. And ultimately, he ruled only over his bed, as it is stated, Behold, it is the bed of Shalom, of Solomon. Three score mighty men are about it, of the mighty men of Israel. Song of Songs 3.7. So again, we see well into the middle of the millennium now that Jews are perceiving Ecclesiastes as not only being Solomonic, but also being authoritative as they are establishing their arguments uh, by using this book, by using resources and quotes from uh, Ecclesiastes. Kohelet Rabbah Parsha 1-1, composed in Talmudic Israel, Babylon, 700-950 CE. So as we can see, this uh, quote that I'm about to read what it's taken from was written between uh, well into the millennia. Uh, this is almost at the end. Um, Kohelet Rabbah, the great Ecclesiastes, is a Haggadic commentary on Ecclesiastes. It follows the biblical book verse by verse, only a few verses remaining without comment. The author confined himself chiefly to collecting and editing earlier sources, including Bereshit Rabbah, Pesikta, Eicha Rabbah, Vaikra Rabbah, Shea Shirim Rabbah, which is Song of Songs, the Jerusalem and Ta uh, Babylonian Talmud, as well as other sources. The editor would probably live between the 6th and, th and 8th centuries, so again, late until the millennia. The words, and this is the quote, the words of Kohelet, king in Jerusalem. This is the Midrash now speaking. This is to say that this is the writing uh, is done with Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration, by the hand of King Solomon. Mishle 22:29. So it's interesting to see how also the Jews are, are claiming that Ecclesiastes is not only Solomonic, but was written uh, with the inspiration of the Ruach HaKodesh, which is just the Holy Spirit. Aramaic Targum, also known as MS Paris 110. Now, I've taken a quote here, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Aramaic square script, but it says pitgame navua in the beginning. And we looked earlier at uh, the special words and one of those words was pitgam, which is just kind of cool to know. But the quote reads, the words of prophecy which Kohelet, that is the son of David the king, who was in Jerusalem prophesied. So not only does this specific writer perceive Ecclesiastes as being Solomonic, but he's also perceiving it as having a prophetic nature. The Council of Jamnia. Now, I'm not going to go too extensive on this because there is a lot of debate, but I will say, however, that due to modern scholarship, this idea um, over the Council of Jamnia has, has declined. Um, and most people use this argument as a way to saying that Ecclesiastes very early on was established as canonical. But nevertheless, I'm going to read. It says, Head quote. Now we happen to know that the Council of Jewish Rabbis was held at Javne, not very far from Jaffa, around the year 90 AD. We have in the Sinyad of Javne the official occasion on which the limits of the Hebrew canon were firmly determined by Jewish authorities. H.E. Ryle, the canon of the Old Testament, 1892. So in 1892, this uh, biblical scholar proposed that very early on uh, the the, uh, the book Ecclesiastes was canonical and was firmly established. However, in the Mishnah Yadayim 3.5, which we previously saw, there is no mention of a council or the word Jamnia. The concept of a council of Jamnia is more of a theory that was proposed and defended by the early 19th century scholar H.E. Ryle. He proposed that the scriptures were firmly closed at this time. However, even though there was a debate about Kohelet in the Songs of Songs, this would still not have covered the entire canonicity of the other books of the Tanakh. So, uh, nevertheless, some people say when they try and uh, find the find the root that or find the root find the date in which Ecclesiastes was was determined to be canonical, sometimes the Council of Jamnia can propose a solution. Although, due to modern scholarship, this solution uh, has proven otherwise. As this chapter comes to an end, I wanted to single out an early Jewish writer and commentator who goes by the name of Rashbam. Rashbam is a Hebrew acronym for Rabbi Shemuel ben Mir, and he lived between 1085 to 1158. This is a little bit over the, the end of the millennia. He was the grandson and student of the great Jewish biblical commentator Rashi. A breakthrough for literal interpretation came with Rashbam. 
Rashbaum displays great sensitivity to the literary nature of Ecclesiastes and was the first to realize that Kohelet was set within a framework, 1, 1 through 2, and the last seven verses were written by those who edited the book. Now, I'm including Rashbaum because we'll be looking at some of the identity at the ideas that he presents later in, in uh, some of the chapters on the narration and framework of Ecclesiastes. So yeah, we're, we're just, I'm just bringing in this guy because we are going to be, be warming up to those ideas. But nevertheless, he does have an interesting perspective as we will see on the, the voices that come out from the text. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at early Christian interpretation. So church fathers and other Christians who perceived the book of Ecclesiastes a little bit after the death of Christ and then up to modern interpretation. First up is Origen. The earliest Christian mention of Ecclesiastes is found in Origen's exegesis on the Song of Songs, and he lived between 184 through 253 CE. So unfortunately, I was not able to find the quote from his exegesis, uh, I did look, but nevertheless, I don't have all the resources to find it. But I do believe that it's there and, and it would have been cool. But Hamaturgus and Dionysus the Great. Shortly after this pre uh, preliminary exploration of Ecclesiastes by Origen, two of his disciples, Gregory Thamaturgus, who lived in 270, and Dionysus the Great, who uh, lived in 265, prepared more formal studies of Ecclesiastes. Dionysus prepared a verse-by-verse -verse exegesis on the first three chapters, and Gregory a metaphrase of the book. A metaphrase of the book of Ecclesiastes is thus the earliest Christian extent work on Ecclesiastes as a whole. This is from the Translatio Syra Pesicto Virtus Testamenti, which just means uh, Syriac translation or the simple Syriac translation, uh, Old Testament. Example, Codice Ambrosano, section Ferve 4. The Peshitta is the Syriac translation of the Old Testament made on the basis of the Hebrew text during the second century CE. As, as Christians were eager to learn the word of God, they started to translate the early Greek scriptures into their own scriptures. And the Syriac translation happened to be, happened to be one of those works. It is a repre reproduction of a Masoretic scroll of the Peshitta version of the Old Testament into modern Syriac, preserved in the Ambrosian Library, Milan, published in 1876. And that quote is talking about the uh, this picture here, as you can see on the left. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the oldest Syriac translation of Ecclesiastes. I was only able to find the, the modern Syriac uh, translation. But you can see here that this is what it would have looked like. Um, this is actually Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Victorinus of Pitou. Victorinus of Pitou, lived in 304, wrote the first exposition of Ecclesiastes in Latin, and Apollinarius of Laodicea, wrote an influential commentary on Ecclesiastes, but was not extant. Eusebius Hieronymus, also known as Jerome. So this here is a quote I'll, uh, I'll be reading on the top left. And this is a quote by Jerome as he's writing to some friends of his. And it says, and so with the long sickness broken, I have not kept inwardly silent this year and been made mute with you. I have dedicated to your names the work of three days, namely the translation of the three scrolls of Solomon, dated to Crotimus and Herodotus, Hilodorus, I'm sorry, AD 398, translation of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs according to the Hebrew. So what really just blows my mind away is that Jerome, while he was sick, as we can see in his letter, literally translated Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes from Hebrew into Latin. And we can see that from his, from his, uh, from his letter that he believed that Ecclesiastes was the work of Solomon. Jerome lived in 420, wrote his commentary on the Hebrew text, which became the standard interpretation of Ecclesiastes until it was challenged by Lutheran reformers a whole millennia later. So what's also mind-blowing about Jerome is that for almost a thousand years, for almost a whole millennia, uh, his, his interpretation was firmly embedded within the, uh, within the Christian community. And until Martin Luther came along, that perspective that he established was broken, which is just insane. Theodore of Mapustia, 
Macbustia, yeah, something like that, lived in the later half of the 4th century and the first half of the 5th century, 492 to 428 AD. Theodore's commentary was lost until the 20th century discovery of a Syriac translation, and earlier we saw what Syriac looked like, of the extensive introduction and commentary on the first seven chapters of his original Greek text. Bonaventura. Amid the renewal of biblical studies in the 13th century, no less than 13 commentaries on Ecclesiastes were written, the most significant of which is that by Bonaventura. 1,211 to 1,274. His postal on Ecclesiastes exploits the possibilities of the literal sense as it manifests itself in his argument that Ecclesiastes provides positive metaphysical truths about the nature of order, about the natural order, I'm sorry. Nicholas of Lyra. Among, among the 14th century commentaries on Ecclesiastes is that by Nicholas of Lyra, 1345 deserves mention. Ginsberg singles him out as inaugurating a new era of, in the exegesis of Ecclesiastes, as with his knowledge of Hebrew and his emphasis on the literal meaning of the text. Martin Luther. Luther, 1483 to 1546, was one of the, was one of the first to explicitly deny Solomonic authorship outside of rabbinic interpretation. Up until Luther's argument, Jerome's literal interpretation had virtually dominated non-rabbinic exegesis for a millennium. So we all we saw earlier how Jerome had had uh, written a perspective about Ecclesiastes, and Martin Luther, uh, up until a, a millennium later, was able to break that interpretation and that perspective. All right, so now we are at our sixth chapter on modern interpretation. So here I do not go extensive because there are. I mean, Ecclesiastes itself is a much contested book. There's a lot of interpretation, there's a lot of debate and argumentation that surrounds this book. So if you personally are looking for a lot of modern uh, ideas and opinions and perspectives, um, this is not the place. But I do want to highlight in this chapter some of just the main ideas that are proposed in modernity today. J.D. Michaelis. In 1751, J.D. Michaelis argued that Ecclesiastes was written by a post-exilic prophet who wrote the book in Solomon's name so as to be able to philosophize more tellingly about the vanity of happiness. So note vanity. This um, writer has been influenced by the perspective of the Hebrew definition of Havel. Um, and that perspective is still changing. It's still being added and worked upon. But note how vanity is very crucial towards this person's writing. Bishop Loth. Similarly, Bishop Loth, 1753, maintained that Solomon is personated in Ecclesiastes, and the language of the book is low. So, personally, I have looked at, I mean, I've read it, I know all of Ecclesiastes in Hebrew, I don't know it verbatim, but it does have more of a simple, repetitive kind of nature, so I don't know if it's low, in my opinion, but I do believe that the syntax and the language and the uh, specific words themselves are more simple than other uh, books that I've looked at myself in Hebrew. Uh, Henstenberg. Henstenberg, 1845, was the first to deny Solomonic authorship of Ecclesiastes in an orthodox English encyclopedia. He's striving after the wind. Remember, Reut Ruach. The usage of the speech in Chaldea, speech in Chaldea, from which they are evidently borrowed, deciding their meaning. So he's saying that this is influenced by um, the Babylonians, essentially. The book is influenced by Babylonian ideas and ideologies, and the literature itself has been borrowed from Chaldean syntax. Michael V. Fox. So this guy isn't dead yet, so he was just kind of born in 1941, but I don't have any works here that I'll be demonstrating that kind of envelop his main ideas. They're actually just scattered out throughout this lecture. Uh, you'll be, you probably have seen them already in yellow quotations, but throughout the future present uh, slides, you'll see them highlighted in yellow. But he is an American biblical scholar. He is Halls Bascom Professor Emeritus in the Department of Hebrew and Semitic Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. So I have read snippets of his book on Ecclesiastes, 
Um, it's actually pretty, pretty intense, but he's definitely a good guy. Um, and he does have some interesting ideas as you, as we will be seeing. Okay. So now I'll be deterring from people and their opinions to more general, broad opinions that I've talked about and discussed about today. So here it is head quote, as the 20th century progressed, a radical source critical approach to Ecclesiastes became rare. And the book came to be seen more and more as a unity, with the exception of the epilogue, which is most universally seen as a later edition. The prime legacy of source criticism in the interpretation of Ecclesiastes is the tendency to read the book without the epilogue. By comparison, in almost all pre-critical interpretations of Ecclesiastes, the epilogue provides the interpretive key. So we can see here that now people in their perspective are shifting from Solomonic authorship to just merely someone else and they're taking the epilogue which is kind of like the well it is a poem well it is debated to be a poem uh, in chapter one verses one three through 14 i believe but it's the part on it talks about you know the sea is never full the eyes are never satisfied that section kind of taking that out <clears throat> seeing it as someone else's work and then going on from there so things are starting to change as you can see Another general point is studies of Ecclesiastes continue to concern themselves with Ecclesiastes' relationship to Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece. The Jewishness of Ecclesiastes has received greater recognition, but its relationship to Greek thought in particular continues to be debated. We will look at this when we get to the Hellenistic and other uh, foreign types of influences, but until now, this is a general uh, topic that is debated still. So I'm going to read this quote and then talk a little bit more about it, because for me, the first time I heard something about this really changed my perspective and changed my assumptions. But very few scholars nowadays defend Solomonic authorship. Most regard Ecclesiastes as being written by an unknown Jew around the third century BC. So for me, before I went into my studies, I had always really been told that Ecclesiastes was just a piece of Solomon. It was an extension of him. It was his work. Um, but this really started to change as I looked into different facts. And now I'm not going to be going into them because in our later chapters, we'll be looking into that. But I kind of just wanted to introduce this general topic so that as we soften up to it, uh, we can start regarding it more as a bit more authoritative. Since 2000, sustained attention has been given to the literary tropes of Ecclesiastes, following on from Fox, Fox's refocusing on Ecclesiastes as a literary whole. Post-structuralism and post-modernism have ine inevitably started to impact the reading of, of Ecclesiastes, as have queer and post-colonial readings regarding women's experiences and Ecclesiastes' attention has tended to focus on 727 through 29 in particular, in an attempt to determine whether Kohelet was a misogynist. So in modern interpretation, sometimes as we look at this scripture, Kohelet, or at least Solomon, whoever the author is, is can partially become off misogynist because of how he quotes in that scripture, uh, out of a thousand young men, uh, or out of a thousand women, or one up one upright women out of a thousand I've not found. So, um, because of our present context, that hermeneutics or that hermeneutical lens has changed the way in which people are perceiving um, the author. So, in this case, perceiving if Solomon was misogynist or um, if he was in. Um, just if he perceived genders differently, so. All right, so as of this point, we're going to be covering our chapter, looking over literary analysis. And here I've laid out six points. And in, this, in these six points, we're going to be seeing as to why modern scholars have, de have been debating for a non-Solomonic authorship. We're going to be looking at the framework a little closer. And more specifically, we're going to be looking at the narration a little closer and what arguments we can draw from those sources. Different genres within Ecclesiastes includes proverbs, autobiography, reflection, poem, rhetorical question, quotations of proverbs. So as you've read through Ecclesiastes, I'm sure you're kind of like, man, this kind of has that um, 
traditional wisdom literature vibe. It sounds almost like Proverbs. Well, that's because it actually does contain some Proverbs. But in this case, as it uses Proverbs, it actually twists the truth of what is originally used and gives its own spin-off or interpretation uh, of, its, um, of its theology. But it also uses the example story, the woe oracle, the blessing, the commands, and the prohibition. All right, point number one. The title Kohelet, unlike the Song of Songs and Proverbs, implicitly connotates Solomonic authorship. Personal authorship established through third person narration would not have been a literary technique foreign to the Middle East. When compared to other biblical literature, we ask ourselves, why now would Solomon switch to a third person narration? Answers may allude to cultural appropriation or personification. So that is to say, in one piece of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, or whoever it is, the narrator, literally, literary, uh, literally, oh my goodness, speaks in the third person voice in the middle of a uh, first person sentence, which is very strange. So the voice that appears to not be of Kohelet, according to modern scholarship, appears in 1 2, two tw uh, I'm sorry, 7 27 and 12 8. For example, this third person voice is not that of Kohelet, as is made particularly clear by the way the voices interact in 727. It is unlikely, according to Fox, and Fox we looked at earlier, that Kohelet would speak of himself in the third person in the midst of a first person sentence. I believe this is very important. Now I'm going to read this quote. Uh, and it states, anonymous third person retrospective frame narrative encompass a first person narrative or monologue, according to Fox. So that's kind of a lot, but it just really means uh, a third person or like an outsider perspective uh, that's used within many uh, Middle Eastern uh, pieces and styles of literature. Right. So five uh, sources that we can we can uh, concretely see that have this type of narrative, according to Fox, is first the instruction for Kamangi, the prophecy of Neferti, the complaint of Apur, Ashkenangi, and Deuteronomy, but uh, more specifically Deuteronomy uh, as Moses in retroflexion, right? So Moses uh, writing in a third person perspective, writing about himself, right? All right, point number two. Perhaps the identity behind Kohelet were to be Solomon. The voice of the third person narration would still remain unresolved. And I already read this quote. So you can just kind of pause it and check it out yourself. But it is interesting that if Solomon were to be speaking or the narrator would, were to be speaking, that they would speak of themselves in the third person in the middle of a first person sentence. So what we can draw from this is that it is unlikely that someone would speak of themselves in this manner. And that from this, it's highly probable or at least likely that this is actually another voice. This is a narrator rather than one single voice, one single narrator. So our third point is that Kohelet claims that he was king over Israel and Jerusalem, right? So implied in the statement is that his reign had come to an end. But uh, kind of interestingly enough is that such a time in Solomon's life is actually never expressed scripturally. So in 1 Kings 11, 41 through 43, uh, the NIV states, Solomon's death. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the book of Annals of Solomon? So this could be the book of Ecclesiastes, but let's just continue on. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over Israel 40 years, right? Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. So what's kind of the significance of this? So Solomon uh, died and then his son immediately took the throne. How is it that when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes uh, and the and the cult and Kohelet says that he was king over Israel, how can we match up scripture uh, with Solomon being king and then now Solomon was king, right? So there's a juxtaposition within uh, the truth of the matter of Solomon being king. Now this could be a way of Solomon saying that he has lost uh, his true kingship to the throne of God, right? Uh, but nevertheless, this is one interesting thing to note.
All right, so point four. Uh, before Solomon, only Saul and David ruled as kings, right? They, they only ruled over Israel. Uh, up, well, before Solomon, right? Kohelet states, I've demonstrated greatness and added wisdom more than all who were over Israel before me. Uh, now, some may argue that it appears that despite the short lineage, he finds great accomplishment in comparison to those of former. So I want to stress this. This is not my opinion, but uh, many, well, not many, but some scholars argue that Solomon is boasting, uh, that Solomon, uh, I believe Solomon was a great king, but some argue that Solomon is kind of boasting that there's really not that many people before uh, his kingship. So why is he creating, uh, s you know, such a big, such a big claim uh, as to why he has become great. So the significance is that of this is that uh, he says over all who were over Israel before me. So we can take notice that those that was only two people, right? Uh, and second to that, some argue that this seems to be a big claim because of the numbers that preceded Solomon. So point four. Um, now you may you may know that if you've read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon kind of stops his little introduction about himself and then moves on to more of an observational point of view. Now, many scholars draw from this that up until chapter three, uh, the Solomonic, what they call the Solomonic fiction fades, right? So he's building parks, he's creating an orchard, um, you know, he's acquiring male and female servants and male and female singers. Uh, but after chapter three, he starts to start observing oppression. Uh, and many scholar, scholars draw from this and debate and argue that if, if it was Solomon, he wouldn't be observing, right? Why would you just observe oppression and not and be frustrated about it if you were in the perfect uh, position to establish justice, right? So the relevance of this is that if Solomon uh, is so angry about uh, justice, why doesn't he do anything about it if he is Solomon, if he's literally the king that can act upon the wickedness of the earth, right? Point six. In comparison to Ecclesiastes, Proverbs frequently uses the name Yahweh to refer to God. Kohelet does not use this name. In Ecclesiastes, rather, Elohim is the dominant name of God. In addition, Creator is used once in the last chapter. So I've actually been looking through Proverbs in Hebrew, and yeah, Proverbs uses Yahweh a handful of times, whereas in Ecclesiastes, the name Yahweh doesn't even come up one time. Now, Creator comes up one time, but Bore Echa is different than Yahweh. So it is interesting to note that if it is Solomon, why isn't Solomon referring to the true name of God as he knows? And if it's not Solomon, what can we tell about the language that is being used? Audience, the usage of the word young man, Bachor, and my son, Beni, implies a young male leadership within Israel, although this is unclear whether this is written within the family, school, or court. Ha'am, the people, alerts us that Kohelet's teaching as a whole was not confined to young males, but was relevant to the whole people of God. So this is to say that when it's using ha'am, it's referring to a general population. It's not just the courts. It's not just the rabbis. Scrolls, codices, and fragments. So this is actually one of my favorite chapters because we're going to be looking at real photos from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So actual pictures of the fragments containing the scriptures of Ecclesiastes. And then from there, we're going to be looking at the earliest records of Ecclesiastes found on other documents and other writings and books. Ecclesiastes in literature. We are beginning with the Qumran fragments, as I've said, which are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then following that, the Septuagint, the Saria Peshitta, which is just the uh, simple or straightforward translation. The Aramaic Targum, the Latin Vulgate, a Midrash containing Kohelet Rabbah, the Aleppo Codex, and then finishing that up, the Westminster Leningrad Codex. So the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hebrew fragments of two Masoretic scrolls of Ecclesiastes were found in K4 at Qumran. The larger one, known as 4QQOHA, was published by James Mullenberg in 1954. This Masoretic scroll preserves portions of 514 through 18, 513 through 17, 61, 63 through 8, 612, and then 7, 1, 
through 10, and then 7, 19 through 20. The smaller Mesoritic scroll for QQOHB was published by Yorick in 1992. It contains portions of 1, 10 through 14. Apart from orthography, the Qumran portions agree with the MT and are of little text critical value. They are significant, however, for the dating of Ecclesiastes. 4QQOHA is dated to 17, I'm sorry, 175 through 150 BC, while Yorick dates 4QQOHB to around the mid first century BC, although he thinks it may be as late as the first century AD. So yes, there were two different scrolls found in Qumran, and they're actually made of different materials. So they, as we'll, we will see here, um, they are different and they are distinguishable. And yes, so there isn't much of Ecclesiastes that was actually found or preserved in Qumran, although we are going to see what that will be looking like here. This is 4Q109, also known as 4QQOHA, and this is the name of the fragment found in Qumran, one of the one of the largest fragments. So I went to the Dead Sea Scrolls database and I took this image from that uh, website, and this is Ecclesiastes 5, 14 through 18, 6, 1, 3 through 8, 12, and then 7, 1 through 10, 7, 19 through 20. And as you can see here, this is a pretty small fragment. It, this is not a full scroll. So not all of Ecclesiastes was found, although nevertheless, it was uh, evident in the Qumran findings. Here is a layout of what was presented in the Qumran findings. So in the green, in the uh, original Hebrew, you can see in the green what was missing from the fragments, and in the brown, you can see what was preserved in the fragments. And that's what we're able to see on the uh, fragment as of today. And it's quite interesting just to think about how most of Ecclesiastes is actually missing from the Dead Sea Scrolls. As you can see here, there's virtually about 30 words still uh, still observable. This picture here is what remains of the rest of 4QQOHA, and still it's only about 20 words maximum. And it is, it's, it's interesting to think about how most of Ecclesiastes is missing from the Qumran portions. But I'm gonna read here chapter seven, just, just verse one, just to kind of give you a picture. It says, Tov shem mi shem en tov, ve yom hamut me yom hivaldo. So it says, a good name is better than good perfume, a good oil, or good ointment, and the day of death better than the day of birth. So these fragments are not of the original fragment that I showed you. They're of a, of a different scroll. And these are from 4Q110, also known as 4QQOHB. And they are dated to the Herodian period. And the fragment on the left here is fragment three. And the fragment on the right here is fragment four. And I got these images from the Dead Sea Scrolls library or database. And it's really cool. On the top layer, you can see how they're in color. But on the bottom layer, it's actually an infrared photo. And it's way easier to see the ink and see the, uh, the, uh, the late Hebrew taking place. It's kind of cool. This image here is a representation of what is taking place in those fragments. So in the green here, as I've explained before, these letters are what are missing from the original text, and the brown here is actually what is evident and can be displayed in those fragments. So, as you can see, this is only about 15 words maximum. All right, so at this point, we're going to be moving on from the Dead Sea Scrolls images, and we're now going to be looking at books and codices and uh, writings that are valid witnesses to the original Hebrew and Greek scriptures. Uh, so first up is the Mishnah. And the Mishnah was composed in Talmudic Israel between 190 to 230 CE, right? So the significance of this book is that it actually quotes Ecclesiastes. So what we can draw from this is that why would the original uh, Jewish scribes and uh, writers uh, use the book of Ecclesiastes if they didn't look at it as canonical or inspired, right? So very early on, we see the Mishnah as a witness and uh, one and uh, a book that validates the uh, canonicity of the Hebrew scriptures, specifically Ecclesiastes, right? So second up now is the Septuagint. Now this is an ancient uh, Greek writing and is a direct uh, witness and translation from the book of Ecclesiastes, right? So it's literally word by word translated 
uh, from Hebrew into Greek. So the relevance of this is that, as I've said, it's a direct witness to the to the early book as it would have looked like originally, right? All right, and now we're looking at the Peshitta. So the Syriac version is known as the Peshitta, which just means the simple or the direct translation, is the oldest Mesoitic scroll from the 5th century AD. So what's unique about this is that, like the Septuagint, it's also a direct translation from the Hebrew scripture into Syriac, which is a different type of Aramaic uh, dialect, right? So again, it's a valid witness to the original Hebrew scriptures. All right, so this is Rabbah Kohelet, and this one's actually a bit more unique. So composed in Talmudic Israel of Babylon, 700 through 950 CE, right? So it was written well into the millennium, right? Kohelet Rabbah, also known as the Great Ecclesiastes, is a Haggadic commentary. It follows the biblical book verse by verse, only a few verses remaining without comment. The author confined himself chiefly to collecting and editing earlier sources, including Bereshit Rabbah and so on, right? The Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, as well as other sources. The editor probably is between the 6th and 8th centuries. So we can see again that this is a uh, later Jewish scribe who has used early, earlier Jewish writings, which we previously saw, to establish this particular writing. So we see again another valid witness to the Hebrew and uh, earlier Greek scriptures of Ecclesiastes. The Aleppo Codex. The Aleppo Codex is a full manuscript of the entire Bible, which was written in about 930. So this clearly contains Ecclesiastes. For more than a thousand years, the manuscript was preserved in its entirety in important Jewish communities in the Near East, Tiberias, Jerusalem, Egypt, and in the city of Aleppo in Syria. However, in 1947, after the United Nations resolution established, establishing the state of Israel, it was damaged in riots that broke out in Syria. At first, people thought it had been completely destroyed. Later, however, it turned out that most of the manuscript had been saved and kept in secret hiding place, kept in a secret hiding place. In 1958, the Aleppo Codex was smuggled out of Syria to Jerusalem and delivered to the president of the States of Israel, Ishak ben Zvi. Leningrad Codex. So one thing actually unique about this book is that it has things which are called Nikodot, and they are vowel pronunciations. They, they are how to pronounce, pronounce the, value, the vowels within the Hebrew. So unlike the Aleppo Codex, there are no dots which give the reader the ability to pronounce these vowels. So the Leningrad Codex, also known as Codex Leningradis, is the oldest complete edition of the Hebrew Bible. The Old Testament uh, in Hebrew in existence. It dates around 1008 to 1010 AD, so historians have really pinned down this date. And this date is confirmed by its colophon, as well as internal and external evidence. Thus, at about the time the Crusaders were starting to march from Europe on their way to conquer the Holy Land, Hebrew Bible editions, such as the Leningrad Codex, were in use by Jews across the Middle East. So this codex really has a lot of history to it, and it has some unique additions to it uh, by the uh, uh, Masoretes. Codex Ambrosianus. Codex Ambrosianus is an extremely important folio sized Syriac Eastern Aramaic manuscript of the entire Aramaic Peshitta Old Testament. It is formerly known as MSB 21, INF 781, in the Ladian Peshitta Institute edition of the Aramaic Old Testament. Codex Ambrosianus is currently located in the Ambrosian Library in Milan, Italy, hence its name. It dates to the 6th or 7th century AD and is written in Estrangela script. It was acquired around 1006 or 1007 AD by the Monastery of the God-Bearer, also known as Dir al-Suryani, Arabic for the Monastery of the Syrians, situated in the Wadi Nirun, in the desert of Sectis, south of Alexandria, Egypt. So this is actually also around the time of the Leningrad Codex. As you can see, the Leningrad was written around 1010 to, uh, or 1008 to 1010 AD, and this here was acquired around 1006 to 1007. Egyptian, Sumerian, Akkadian, and Hellenistic literature. In this chapter, we'll be covering sources of information that may have influenced Kohelet's pursuit for wisdom, his pursuit for reason and understanding that is very different from traditional Old, Old Testament wisdom. 
So here we're actually going to be reading uh, those sources of, or at least possible sources of information that may have changed Kohelet's epistemology. We'll be reading some, some poems, some songs, and some very important writings that sound very similar in nature to Ecclesiastes' tone and mood. First up, Hellenistic influence. So what has influenced Kohelet's understanding from a Hellenistic or Western uh, perspective? 1.6 is similar to Stoic assertions of the circular motion of air. 1.4, in which the author affirms the, uh, that generations come and go, but the earth stands forever. Is akin to the Stoic view, all things fall back on the earth and arise from the earth. Stoic determinism is similar to Kohelet's teaching in 3.11 and 7.13. Kohelet's teaching, and there is nothing new under the sun, is echoed in Stoic teachings. Fox suggests that Kohelet's affinities with Epicureanism are particularly significant, with its, with its view that sensory experience is the ultimate source and arbitrator of knowledge. Epicurus values spiritual over bodily satisfactions because these are more likely to bring the soul to rest, which is his ideal. This is quite different from Kohelet's affirmation of eating and drinking and enjoying the wife of one's youth. Kohelet's epistemology is akin to, but also different from that of Kohelet. Epistemologically, Kohelet's is very different from that of the Stoics. Although like the Stoics, Kohelet relies heavily on observation and perception that genuine knowledge could be attained. For Kohelet, his anonymous epistemology leads him again and again to finding life ungraspable. For Aristotle, however, True knowledge could indeed be arrived at inter alia through reason and observation, whereas for Kohelet, observation, reason, and experience lead him to confusion and enigma. Ecclesiastes has elements of a Greek diatribe which contain bitter and abusive speech uh, through written word, ironic or satirical criticism, and prolonged discourse. Uh, it can also be understood by some scholars, and I want to um, emphasize scholars, uh, as somewhat of a literary rant. So in this sense, uh, a Greek diatribe consists, uh, or is, um, uh, has a, a literary design uh, that has, you know, elements of uh, Greek satire uh, and can sometimes be thought of by some scholars as a literary rant. Relevance, right? So Hellenism, as well as the philosophies received by the pre-Socratics, entered Judea when it was conquered in 332 BC by Alexander the Great, right? Uh, following its ideological assimilation, tension and disunity sprouted within Jewish circles, right? Um, this difference in thought influenced the Maccabean Revolt, where traditional Jews fought Jews seeking assimilation. Jews seeking to preserve traditional wisdom literature may have written Ecclesiastes as a book designed to test its students uh, who have um, or who are about to assimilate or who are uh, threatened by assimilating into Greek culture, right? It may have served as a tool uh, used to help identify foreign and deteriorating ideologies contradictory to scripture uh, and thus help deter, uh, deter traditional wisdom's dilution, right? However, there is no definitive influence received from Greek philosophy, and this would debunk Solomonic authorship because uh, if Solomon, well, Solomon was uh, alive around 1000 BC, and this is taking place around 180 through 150 BC, and that's almost 850 years later. Um, so that's kind of out of the way. And then aside from that, just really the relevance here is that if it is uh, influenced um, by, you know, Hellenistic, uh, just Hellenistic context, uh, we can see that it would probably be likely that uh, it was written by a uh, maybe a traditional Jew who was trying to deter his students, or at least the people within the traditional uh, community from assimilating into uh, foreign ideologies that would, um, you know, destroy the destroy the concept of traditional Muslim literature. Right. Elements of Egyptian influence. Egyptian banquet songs, such as the Songs of the Harper, were also composed at a time of political upheaval and disintegration and shares the element of skepticism. Grave biographies hold narration in first person speeches, which also explore ethical maxims such as the retributive paradox. So in Proverbs, the retribution is that A leads to B. A always leads to B. You do, you do this and this and action A follows. 
And whereas in a retributive paradox, A, in fact, leads to Z, or A leads to F, or A leads to E. Things don't always match up as we would figure from Proverbs. So royal instruction asserts not only authority, but is established by narration and content of the biography. So now I'm actually going to read the Song of the Harper. And this version of the poem is from the Tomb of the Pharaoh, in Tef, the Middle Kingdom. There is also a copy of the text on the Papyrus Harris 500 from the New Kingdom. He is happy, this good prince. Death is a kindly fate. A generation passes, another stays. Since the time of the ancestors, the gods who were before rest in their tombs. Blessed Dumbles, too, are buried in their tombs. Yet those who built tombs, their places are gone. What has become of them? I have heard the words of Imhotep of Hordejef, whose sayings are recited in whole. What are their places? Their walls have crumbled, their places are gone, as though they had never been. None comes from there to tell of their needs, to calm our hearts, until we go where they have gone. Hence rejoice in your hearts, forgetfulness profits you. Follow your heart as long as you live, put myrrh on your head, dress in fine linen, anoint yourself with oils fit for a god, heap up your joys, let your heart not sink, follow your heart and your happiness, do things on earth as your heart commands. When there comes to you that day of mourning, the weary-hearted Osiris hears not their mourning. Wailing saves no man from the pit, make holiday, do not be weary of it. Lo. None is allowed to take his goods with him. Lo, none who departs come back again and again. Translation by Donald Mackenzie, Egyptian Myth and Legend. The following version was found in the tomb of Neferhotef the priest. It was inscribed during the new kingdom of ancient Egypt. How reposed is this righteous Lord, the kindly fate has come to pass. Bodies pass away since the time of the gods. New gener generations come in their place. Re, Re shows himself at dawn, autumn goes to rest in the western mountains. Men beget, women conceive. Every nostril breathes the air. Dawn comes, and their children have gone to their tombs. Make holiday, O priest. Put incense and fine oil together to your nostrils, and garlands of lotus and uh, myrt flowers to your breast. While your sister who you love sits at your side, put songs and music before you. Cast all evil behind you, think of your joys, until that day has come of landing, and, and the land that loves silence, where the, where the heart of the one whom he loves does not weary. Make holiday Neferhotev, the justified good priest. Pure of hands, I have heard all that happened to the blank. The bu their buildings have crumbled, their, do their dwellings are no more. They are as if they had not come into being since the time of the god. Adopted from M. Linkthen, 1976, Ancient Egyptian Literature, Volume 2. The following version was found in the tomb of Inkakal, the overseer of workers at the Royal Cemetery of Thebes. It was inscribed during the New Kingdom of Ancient Egypt. Sung by his harpist for Osiris, chief of the crew in the Palace of Truth, Inkakal, who says, I am this man, this worthy one who lives redeemed by abundance of good, tendered by God indeed, all who come into being as flesh pass on, and have since God walked the earth. The young blood mounts to their places, the busy fluttering souls and bright transfigured spirits who people the world below, and those who shine in the stars with Orion. They built their mansions, they built their tombs, and all men rest in the grave. So set your home well in the sacred land, that your God name last because of it, that your good name last because of it. Care for your works in the realm under God, that your set in the west, that your seat in the west be splendid. The waters flow north, the wind blows south, and each man goes to his hour. So seize the day, hold holiday, be unwearied and seizing alive, you and your own true love. Let not your heart be troubled during your sojourn on earth. But seize the day as it passes, put incense and sweet oil upon you, garland flowers at your breast, while the lady alive in your heart forever delights as she sits before as she sits beside you. Grieve not your heart whatever comes, let sweet music play before you, 
Recall not the evil, loathsome to God, but have joy, 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 and pleasure. O upright man, man just and true, patient and kind, content with your lot, rejoicing, not speaking evil. Let your heart be drunk on the gift of day until the day comes when you anchor. Translation, translation by J. L. Foster in Echoes of Egyptian Voices. So when I read these three songs, I am, I am just, I'm just really blown away. This is, this really hits me, you know, like when I think of my life and when I think of just the, uh, the transients of life, how, how quickly things pass on and how poetic this, this, uh, this poem encapsulates that truth. Um, I'm really impacted, uh, honestly. Okay, so what's the relevance of all this, right? Well, during the time of Solomon's reign, Egypt and Israel are attributed to experiencing the greatest point of connectivity with each other. By connectivity, I just mean uh, agricultural, economical ties, right? Uh, Solomon is so connected that he marries Pharaoh's daughter, right? Uh, we see that in, in uh, 1 Kings, I believe. Uh, as one of pursued wisdom, it is possible that Solomon may have adopted the literary techniques found in Egyptian wisdom literature, such as, such as we saw in the Songs of the Harper, right? So as Solomon is uh, assimilating, perhaps, into Egyptian culture, um, or at least as he's pursuing Egyptian, or maybe not Egyptian wisdom, but just wisdom at, uh, in itself, uh, and as he is exposed to that uh, Egyptian culture, he is, he's taking... Uh, what he's finding, the techniques and the uh, overall designs and moods, as we saw in the Songs of the Harper, and using them in his own writings, right? Elements of Sumerian Influence The Epic of Gilgamesh If you have listened to the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know that it has that biblical undertone to it, the way the literature presents uh, its imagery. It sounds, yeah, like I said, very close to the, um, the way the authors in the Bible present their own imagery, but Gilgamesh, where are you hurrying to? You will never find that life for which you are looking. When the gods created men, they allotted to him death, but life they retained in their own keeping. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things. Day and night, night and day, dance and be merry. Feast and rejoice, let your clothes be fresh. Bathe yourself in water, cherish the little child that holds your hand, and make your wife happy in your embrace. For this too is the lot of man. Ecclesiastes, and now I'm going to compare this to a scripture in Ecclesiastes, specifically 9, 7 through 8 in the NIV. Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved of what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Another quote from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Humans are born, they live, then they die. This is the order that the gods have decreed. But until the end comes, enjoy your life. Spend it in happiness, not despair. Savor your food, make each your days a delight. Bathe and anoint yourself, wear bright clothes that are sparkling clean. Let music and dancing fill your house. Love the child who holds you by the hand and give your wife, wife pleasure in your embrace. That is the best way for a man to live. And again, in the comparison to Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 8, Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. So again, very similar to Ecclesiastes in nature. Again, from the Epic of Gilgamesh. How long does a building stand before it falls? How long does a contract last? How long will brothers share the inheritance before they quarrel? How long does hatred, for that matter, last? Time after time, the river has risen and flooded. The insect leaves the cocoon to live but a minute. How long is the eye able to look at the sun? And com in comparison to the epilogue in Ecclesiastes 1, 4 through 7. Generation come and generation go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Rounded rat goes, forever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the stream comes from, there they return again. There is the house whose people sit in darkness. Dust is their food and clay is their meat. 
They are clothed like birds with wings for covering. They see no light. They sit in darkness. I entered the house of dust and saw the kings of the earth, their crowns put away forever. This is Ecclesiastes 5.17. All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. From Gilgamesh. How can I keep silent? How can I stay quiet? My friend whom I love has turned to clay. My friend Inkadu, whom I love has turned to clay. Shall I not be like him and also lie down, never to rise again through all eternity? As for man, his days are numbered. Whatever he might do, it is but wind. Ecclesiastes 1, 13-14 I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. This is the last quote that I will be presenting from the Epic of Gilgamesh, but it says, a three-stranded cord is hardest to break. And now Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So before we wrap up um, Sumerian literature, I just wanted to say that from these sources, we can really understand how this may have influenced Kohelet. This may have influenced the tone in which Kohelet is trying to uh, embrace or at least um, use as a literary device to en encapsulate the, the uh, perspective of worldly wisdom, how sorrowful, how lonely, and how um, dreadful it can really be to, to stand in the place of this. So the relevance, right? Some scholars believe that Zerubbabel, who lived in 559 BC, may have been the author to Ecclesiastes. He was Davidic and Solomonic in nature, since he was a direct descendant from the house of David, right? And helped in the rebuilding of the temple, like Solomon. And he was also highly political, which may also um, be why he was observing so much oppression uh, and had so much re regard for, you know, political and um, more um, hierarchical uh, functions, right? So his name means seed of Babel, indicating an exposure to Babylon, right? So if he's named, you know, after Babel, then that means that he would be, you know, accustomed or at least situated within that environment, right? His relationship with Babylonia may point to Ecclesiastes' relationship to the Epic of Gilgamesh, because Babylon is accustomed to Samaria, obviously, uh, as well as the Aramaic words found in scripture dating to the 5th century, uh, with which Babylon roughly uh, spoke between the 7th century and onward, uh, BC up until, you know, now, right? So um, the Aramaic words found, uh, you know, Babylonians spoke Aramaic for a while, right? Um, and those political words may also point to why uh, Zerubbabel was using those political words, right? Um, so all in all, uh, the relevance is that Zerubbabel um, has somewhat, or at least could be attributed to, by some scholars to having somewhat of a, um, um, relationship to the, uh, you know, writing of Ecclesiastes. Moving on to Akkadian influence. So this is very similar in nature also to Sumerian influence. It's a, are both, they both share the space of the uh, Mesopotamian sphere. This is from Man and His God. The dialogue between man and his God is the earliest known text to address the answer to the question of why God permits evil, or theosity. The reflection, a reflection on human suffering. It is a piece of wisdom literature extant only on a single clay cuneiform tablet written in Akkadian and attributed to Kalbanan, Kalbunan. On the last line, an individual otherwise unknown. It is dated to the later part of the old Babylonian period, around about the reign of Amni Ditana, according to Landert, and is currently housed in the Lowry Museum, Ascension number AO4462, just in case you wanted to look that up. But this is from the uh, from the piece. It says line three through forty five. Thirty thirty five through forty five, sorry. My righteous shepherd has become angry with me, a youth, and I looked upon me with hostility. My herdsman has plotted malice against me, although I am not his enemy. My companion does not say a true word to me. My friend falsifies my truthfully spoken words. A man of deceit has spoken insulting words to me, while you, my God, do not respond to him. 
and you carry off my understanding. An ill wisher has spoken insulting words to me. He angered me, was like a storm, and created anguish. I am wise. Why am I tied up with ignorant youth? I am discerning. Why am I entangled among ignorant men? So this also has a very similar tone to Job, um, that sorrowful tone. But interestingly, this also poses the question of the retributive paradox. You know, Kohelet is observing oppression, oppression in his own town. And this uh, young man here is also observing oppression, although he has not, in his own eyes, done nothing wrong. Or in his own eyes, he has followed a particular path, yet for some reason, ill-gotten occurrences are uh, befalling him. I will praise the Lord of Wisdom. The poem of the righteous sufferer is a poetic monologue, opening and concluding with hymns that tells how a noble gentleman, once important and prosperous, for no apparent reason, was driven to disgrace and disease by the god Marduk. And note how the god Marduk is also a god presented in the uh, biblical narrative. His story is set as exemplary of the two sides to divine character, anger and forgiveness, as, as exemplary of the fathom unfathomable, unfathomable will of the gods, but also as an account of unbroken faith in the divine designs for deliverance, even in face of all possible catastrophes and impending death. Terrifying, this is the uh, quote from I Will Praise the Lord of Wisdom. Terrifying signs beset me. I was forced out of my house. I wandered outside. My omens were confused. They were abnormal every day. The prognostication of diviner and dream interpreter could not explain what I was undergoing. What was said in the street portend ill for me. When I lay down at nights, my dream was terrifying. The king, incarnation of the gods, son of his people. His heart was enraged with me, and appeasing him was impossible. So again, this is also like Job, but in this case, like Ecclesiastes, it is also bringing up the uh, retributive paradox, how A is not leading to B, how Someone has been following a particular path, but for no apparent reason, they are experiencing bad circumstances. Okay, so last up is the Akkadian Kuthan legend. And Ecclesiastes also exhibits a close similarity with the Akkadian Kuthan legend, which is best preserved in Akkadian didactic autobiography when analyzing the text in a threefold manner absent from the section of the third person narration. So pretty much what it's saying is when you take out the third person narration found in Ecclesiastes, it's similar in nature to the Akkadian Kuthan legend. Longman observes these three elements common among Akkadian literature, fictional autobiography with a blessing and a curse, fictional autobiography with a didactic ending, and fictional autobiography with a prophetic ending. However, most Akkadian literature was written in poetic form, whereas a, a, a fictional autobiography stresses its authorship through prose, or fake, real-sounding dialogue and monologue. If Ecclesiastes is not poetic, which is still highly debatable, this would oppose a fundamental aspect of Akkadian literature. So that is to say, Akkadian literature is, for the most part, established through uh, poems and poetic-sounding literature, whereas if Ecclesiastes is not poetic, that would oppose the ability to be influenced by Akkadian sources. Wow, so thank you for uh, sticking with me all the way through this. Uh, we're now actually at our last, last chapter covering the pre-analytical message. Uh, and I just wanted to say, although this is probably longer than YouTube uh, videos or lectures or sermons on this book, uh, I can guarantee you that you've taken away something in your spirituality, right? Uh, that as you commune with the Spirit and with Yahweh, uh, that your her hermeneutical lens has changed and uh, your personal exegesis over the interpretation of this book has probably changed a little bit, right? Uh, but although uh, we probably can assume that it was not written by Solomon, uh, it, is self, it itself is still authoritative uh, and it's still spiritually inspired, right? So although it hasn't been written by his hand, Solomon, uh, we can still consider it a canonical book, right? And we see that from this point, the author probably accumulated uh, familiar forms of poetry, right? Philosophy and literature, to stimulate its Israelite audience to deny the wisdom that was common to them in their assimilation to most likely the Greek and Hellenistic culture of that time, 
uh, as it was conquered probably by Alexander the Great and, and, and maybe a little bit before or after uh, the war, the Maccabean revolt, right, in that war. But nevertheless, uh, this is a reminder and warning for us Christians today to be on guard towards what the world defines as wise, so as to not destroy ourselves in the in her bitter in the uh, the bitter embrace of folly, right? So uh, as always, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this. Shalom. As a final message, you can actually find more videos and lectures like this on my YouTube account. Uh, although I, I don't have many more, uh, at this time in my next lecture, I'm going to be covering the book of Ecclesiastes narrated in both Hebrew and Young's literal translation, which is a beautiful uh, translation that sticks actually rigidly to the original Hebrew words. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I hope to see you in my next video and Shalom. So as you could probably tell throughout this PowerPoint, I've had quotations uh, marked with the um, just yellow, right? And uh, these are from uh, the book uh, Ecclesiastes. It's a commentary uh, by Craig, uh, Craig G. Bartholomew. And if you want to look up for more information uh, from this source, uh, this would be an excellent read. Thankfully, I have actually included a list of works cited uh, that you can check out for yourself. Uh, I know this is super small if you're looking on this on a phone, uh, but if you check it out on the iPad or on a tablet or a computer, maybe even a TV if you can, uh, this is this will be much easier and accessible for you to read. Uh, thank you again for watching and always enjoy.